And here we go. So thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us today for the effective communications workshop uh, seminar by Houston Community College. My name is Ravi Brambhat. I'm the director for student innovation and entrepreneurship at HCC, and I'm super thrilled to have uh, our speech and communication faculties and our entrepreneur and residents join us today for this presentation on effective communications. Uh, for this session, the session is being live streamed on YouTube as well as shared on our Facebook group, Eagle to Eagle, and it will be available on the community learnings uh, at YouTube page for uh, anyone in the uh, community to learn from. So I asked all of you to stay uh, video and audio mute as you're listening in. And then during the Q&A section, uh, we will ask if you have any questions for those of us who are uh, you know, joining us live on WebEx. Uh, but then we'll also have questions that we'll read off of from the Facebook uh, and the uh, YouTube uh, shares. Um, so let's uh, let me just quickly give you an overview. Uh, we'll ask Dr. Stack to kick it off, and she'll make a presentation on an effective delivery. We'll have uh, Professor James Duvall share a conversation on uh, vocal variety, and then also Professor Tracy uh, Lieg uh, talk about nonverbal communications. Uh, and Dr. Stack will will further uh, introduce each of the faculty as well. And then lastly, we'll have our entrepreneur and residents, also the HCC Foundation chair, Chairman, uh, Mr. David Regenbaum, talk about business pitch presentations. They'll share with you the nine C's of an effective elevator pitch. It, it may have changed to, to eight or nine, and, but I'm uh, uh, always uh, very keen on learning from him. So uh, that is going to give us our seminar content, and then we'll follow up with Q&A. Uh, shortly after. Um, again, the goal is to uh, go straight from all presentations and then go to Q&A. But of course, at any time, if you have questions, put it in the chat, uh, whether it be WebEx, YouTube, or, or Facebook. Uh, just let us know, and then we'll read them at the end. So, um, Dr. Stagg, I'm going to ask, uh, how are you this morning? Uh, Hi, Ravi. Thank you for that introduction. I'm doing pretty good. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. Great. Uh, I'm getting a clear audio and a clear video from you, and uh, I'm excited to listen in. So I'm going to pass it to you. Uh, you've got the presenter ball. Uh, take it away whenever you're ready. Um, Dr. Stagg on effective delivery. Okay. Thank you all for joining us today as we talked about effective communication with a highlight on effective delivery. So communication is often something that we as human beings take for granted. Every day we communicate, we talk, we have conversations, we text people, we go to Starbucks, we go to McDonald's, we make orders, and we oftentimes do not stop and think about communication and how we're communicating. Most of us have not taken a class on how to communicate effectively. And so it's something that we tend to take for granted. So in this presentation, we're going to talk about what it means to be a competent communicator because a competent communicator strives to communicate effectively. So the definition of communication competence, it is communicating in ways that are appropriate, effective and ethical. So, depending upon the situation in which you're communicating, you have to think about is what I'm saying is my body language is my nonverbal communication. Is this appropriate for this particular setting? Now, we all know how you communicate at school and in the workplace is completely different than how you communicate at home. So you have to be mindful of that when you're an effective communicator. To be an effective communicator, you want to begin to use your nonverbal communication and your verbal communication to illustrate your point to communicate with other people. And when you're making that point, you need to be sure that you're ethical. So when you're being ethical in your communication, you want to say things that are morally acceptable. You don't want to use words that could be offensive. So keep all of those things in mind to help you to be an effective communicator. So as we move on, we're gonna talk about 
some key characteristics for effective delivery. So the, these are some of my favorite points to cover when I'm teaching a public speaking class. But keep in mind that even though we're focusing on effective delivery, these are key tips that you can use at any type of communication. So whether you're communicating with a family member, with a coworker, with a friend, you can use these different tips. So the first thing when you're presenting and when you're communicating, strive for naturalness. You want to be natural. Have you ever, I'm sure that you've watched a news presentation and you look at the news anchors and how they're communicating. And perhaps you think to yourself, well, when I talk, I wanna start doing this, or I wanna start pointing or using my fingers. Try to make sure that you're picking something that is natural to you. So if it's natural for you to use hand gestures, use hand gestures. If it's natural for you to walk to one side of the room and then walk to another side of the room, use that space. However, if that's not comfortable for you, don't do it. So if you're not comfortable using those hand gestures, simply put your hands to your sides or relax your hands in front of you. If you're not comfortable walking from side to side during your presentation, you can stay in one position. So try to be natural. Secondly, you want to show enthusiasm. Now to show enthusiasm, try to make sure that the tone of your presentation matches the way that you're delivering that presentation. So if it's a somber tone, you want to create that somber tone with your voice. If it's something that should be excited, then you want to create that excitement with your voice. So if you're talking about roller coasters, you wouldn't say, well, the other day I went on to a roller coaster. You want to show that enthusiasm and that passion with your tone. So when you're presenting a presentation to pull your audience members in, you have to have that sense of enthusiasm. Now, when I'm teaching this in class, my students often think that I'm saying that you have to talk like a cheerleader. Like you have to be excited with everything that you say. And that's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying that you wanna project a sense of enthusiasm when you're talking. Now, the third, and to me, the most key thing when you're delivering a presentation is that you wanna project a sense of confidence no matter who you are talking to. One of my favorite quotes by Eckhart Tolle, he says that you are neither superior nor inferior to anyone. So when you're presenting, whether you're talking to the CEO of a company, whether you're talking to a custodian, you should use the same sense of confidence. You should use the same type of delivery. So to project a sense of confidence, you want to use your body language and you also want to use your voice. So to project that confidence, make sure that you have eye contact. Look at your audience when you're talking to them. You also want to think about your posture. So when you're delivering a presentation, your posture should be, you should be sitting upright or if you're standing, you want to stand upright but you don't want to be too stiff, but you want to be, make sure that you have that good natural posture. You also want to make sure that you don't look down or you don't look up at the ceiling, but that you look directly at your audience. So when you're delivering a presentation, you can come across as passive, but you could also come across as aggressive. And you don't want to be neither of those. You want to be right in the middle. So when I say passive, passive means that you're not making that eye contact, that you kind of don't look like you're in control of that presentation. And if you're not in control of the presentation, you're putting the presentation control in the hands of the audience. And if you're the one delivering that presentation, you need to be in control of it. So to project that sense of confidence, you don't want to be looking down. You don't want to have a low volume. You don't want to twiddle your hands nervously because then you're not showcasing your confidence. So to, you also don't want to be aggressive. So what does an aggressive person look like when they're talking? Perhaps they talk too loud. They also tend to get too close to the audience and they're making eye contact. But when they're making that eye contact, it's almost like I dare you to look away from me. So it's almost like a stare down. So you don't want to have that type of delivery in your presentation. You just want to be natural. You want to be comfortable. 
but you need to be confident in yourself. So when you walk into a room, when you're getting ready for a presentation, whether it's an elevator pitch, whether it's a presentation that you have to give in the classroom, you walk in there like you have a sense of confidence. Even if you're not confident, who can build you up better than yourself? So build yourself up and project that sense of confidence. Now for me, one thing that I feel can boost my confidence is to make sure that I like the way that I'm looking when I'm giving a presentation. You know how sometimes you can wake up in the morning and you just have a case of the uglies. It's like your hair ain't right, your makeup isn't right, nothing is going right for you. So imagine having to give a presentation when you feel like I'm looking a mess. So instead of walking into a presentation feeling like I don't look good, make sure that you look good. Comb your hair the way that you like your hair. If you like to wear makeup, wear makeup. Wear something that you feel comfortable in so that you can project that sense of confidence. And the last key aspect with effective delivery is to be direct. How can you be direct with your presentation? Well, you can make sure that you have eye contact. So you use that eye contact to be direct with your, eye, with your audience members. You can also use a friendly tone. So when you're talking and try to use a friendly tone to interact and engage with your audience. Now with me and my tone, I tend to get tension in my vocal cords. So it's kind of like when I wake up, I never know what kind of voice I'm gonna have. It can be a tense voice, it can be a harsh voice, it could be a stressed voice, but still I try to make sure that I have that relaxed and friendly tone when I'm engaging with people. And another key thing is to animate your facial expressions. The easiest way that you can animate your facial expression is to smile. So when you're delivering a presentation, don't look like a deer caught in the headlights. Instead, try to use your smile to connect with your audience. So moving on, a lot of people struggle with confidence, especially when they're delivering a presentation, because who likes to give a speech? Personally, I have a love-hate relationship with giving a presentation. I hate the preparation. I hate the nervous feeling. But that feeling that you have when you deliver an awesome presentation, nothing compares. So even though it's something that we don't like to do, if we have to do it, let's boost our confidence. So a key way that you can boost your confidence, prepare and practice. If you practice your presentation prior to the delivery, then you're going to be more prepared. Try to spend two to three hours practicing for that presentation just so that you're comfortable with it. And when I say to practice your presentation, you don't have to memorize it word for word, but practice it to where when you're delivering that presentation, it comes smoothly and that you don't have to look at your note cards or if your note cards fell down, you would still be able to move on with that presentation. Another characteristic, our strategy, modify your thoughts and your attitudes. Have y'all ever heard of the law of attraction? So if you send out negative vibrations, you're gonna get negative thoughts and you're gonna get negative actions that come back. So instead of having that negative thought, oh, I'm not prepared, I'm gonna do horrible on this presentation. No, prepare and tell yourself, I'm going to do good on this presentation. I practice. I, I'm confident. I know what I'm talking about. So try to modify your thoughts and your attitudes. A third characteristic that you can use is to visualize success. So with visualizing success, think about before you deliver that presentation, try to put yourself in that room where you're going to be delivering the presentation and say to yourself, I'm going to give a successful presentation. My audience is going to be receptive to me. They're going to smile. They're going to laugh if I say something funny. So try to visualize that success. One thing that makes us so nervous when we're delivering a presentation is that we think that the audience is thinking horrible things about us. Well, they could be. <laughs> However, 90% of the time, they're not even thinking about you. So even though you're up there delivering a presentation, you are the furthest thing from their mind. However, because we're the spotlight of attention, 
we think, oh, they're thinking about my face. They're thinking about my voice. They're thinking about what I have on. Don't even worry about it. Don't take yourself so seriously and try to relax. So relaxing is one thing that I struggle with because I'm, a, I'm not a procrastinator because I'm a perfectionist. Definitely not a procrastinator, but I'm a perfectionist. And when you're a perfectionist, you want everything to be perfect. And when it's not perfect, it's like you beat yourself up. But you have to try to relax. So if I'm delivering this presentation and I forget to say something, I just have to relax. I can't stress about it. So some tips that you can use to help yourself not feel so anxious, try to use stress control breathing. That's where you breathe from your diaphragm. Again, I say this, but it's not something that I have mastered. I go to speech therapy and it's something that I struggle with having to use that stress control breathing. But what it means is that when you're talking, you wanna make sure that you take a deep breath in and then when you begin to talk, you exhale. So try to use that stress control breathing and that can help you to relax. And then lastly, to help you feel more confident, try to use movement. So you can use gestures, you can walk around, but try to use that movement to minimize that anxiety. So some features of effective delivery, capture the audience's attention. And we'll hear more about that when David talks about the pitch presentation capture your audience's attention, tell the audience why you're there, clarify your purpose, make it clear to them why you are delivering that presentation, convey the necessary information. So whatever they need to know, make sure that you tell the audience. If you're using a PowerPoint, don't go crazy with your PowerPoint. Try not to have too many words, try not to have too many graphics, try to use a simple PowerPoint presentation and always summarize before you move on. And when you have your conclusion, summarize. So when you're delivering a presentation, it's like you're taking your audience on a journey. So at the beginning of that journey, tell them where you're taking them. When you move to your main points, tell them where you're going, take them on that journey. And then when you get to the conclusion, remind them where you took them. And that will help you to have an effective delivery. So in conclusion, with this part of the presentation, we have talked about what a competent communicator is, is, how we communicate every single day, and when we're communicating to deliver a presentation, some tips to help us manage our confidence and to make us feel more comfortable when we're delivering that presentation. Now, verbal and nonverbal communication, they play a vital role in the effect of your presentation on your audience members. So as we move on, Professor James Duvall is gonna further explain the role of verbal communication. All right, good morning, everybody. I hope you could hear me clearly. And if my camera should, uh, having some camera problems uh, this morning, but if it should go out, my apologies to you uh, in advance. And then as Dr. Stagg said uh, quite well, it, it verbal communication matters quite a lot. And let's actually dive right into it. And I think I have the uh, ask for control <laughs> is grayed out. So would it be okay, Dr. Stagg, if uh, you, thank you so much. And let's head on over to the next slide. And let's first talk about volume. You must take a breath and project your voice. It does matter to be able to be heard by everyone, not just in front of you, but also in the back as well. Now there's a very, very, very big difference between projecting your voice and screaming at people. That's not something <laughs> we want to do uh, as we're trying to convey our message to the people, but we want to be sure we are heard by everybody as best as we can. A couple of things to keep in mind is uh, how big the room is, uh, how many people are in the room with you, if they're provided a microphone for you, hopefully they do, if it's a large enough room. Uh, and also sometimes you just have to battle through the noises that comes with the environment. And that's why sometimes you have to be able to project your voice, take that breath in and belt it out. Don't scream at people, you don't need to do that. 
<laughs> but you should be able to project your voice uh, for everyone to hear you. Another thing to keep in mind is your pacing that you have during your speech. Now, for us, we actually have uh, some have a faster pace when it comes to speaking. Others have a slower pace. Uh, but you'd be very surprised. I actually tell this to my students a lot who have a faster pace is to slow down just a hint. And you'd be very surprised the effects that it'll have not only for you to have control over the words, but also for the audience members as well. And for some who speak a little slower to pick up the pace just a little bit. And again, you'd be surprised and what can come with the, uh, the effects for the audience and for yourself. Don't be the last thing we want to do is to have people perceive you to be speaking too slow or too fast because that can have a negative perception for you and, and people thinking, oh, this person must be really nervous or they don't know what they're talking about uh, when you do. But this is what uh, the perception of the pace that you give the audience can have, which is why strike the right pace throughout your speech with the audience. It also gets to this next aspect, as Dr. Stagg has said very well, is striking the right tone. We want people who are listening to you to know that you are passionate about the things you are talking about. That does matter quite a lot. Also, at the same time, we all have varying tones. You could go very low, like I did there, or you could go really high, like I did there. But um. But the big thing you want to do is strike the natural varying tones that you have. The big thing we really don't want to go for is to go for a monotone <laughs> aspect in your speech because we do not want to sound like a robot uh, to the audience members. We've all been through some of the lectures and speeches in the past when people have a very monotone sound to them. And of course, who wants to sit through that for an hour? And at that point, within 10 minutes, people will be asleep. And that's the last thing we want to do is to put people to sleep. Use the varying tones that you have. Use them with purpose. Strike the mood that you want to get across to the audience members. Because if there's a certain emotion you want the audience to feel, it starts with you. And using your tone to enable them to feel that mood uh, for them to have starts with you. Uh, another thing about your tone is with purpose. Don't just, again, don't just go high and low just because you can. You have to use them in a strategic fashion, in a natural fashion, that will bring about the effects that you want with the audience members. And please, 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 please do not sound like a robot. That's the, that's the big thing I don't want our students or anyone really to sound like. Show that you're human. Show that you are passionate. Strike the tone that you want with the audience because it starts with you. And can we go to the next slide, please? And we will now talk about pauses because here's the thing about pauses. Like that. Because, <laughs> because it, it, it creates this effect with the audience members like I did there on purpose to create an awkward fashion, an awkward fashion and mood with the audience members. As I like to tell my students, it's like a telling a joke. You, know, you set the people up and then give it just a bit amount of time for them to think about it. And then you time it when you want to come in uh, with the next uh, phrase or in this case here, a jab line. Uh, same thing with your speeches. It's all about how you time your pauses because you could use them to great effect with your audience, or you can make it very awkward, as I just did, as I tend to do with my speeches. But that's the thing we do not want to do <laughs> when it comes to pauses. So please be sure to use it strategically with your audience members and also with purpose. Uh, another thing when it comes to our voice are these vocal fillers or these, these fluencies that we all have. We all have them, and we actually do them a lot during conversation, and we don't realize it. Uh, and a lot of times, it's because our brains automatically filters out these disfluencies that comes out of us because we already know that it's not important to the message that we need to listen to. But it's something we still want to avoid as we are giving a speech to anybody because we want to show the polish that comes with a delivery 
uh, in the message. So we want to make sure we try to clean up those ums, those uhs, and especially the case when it comes to 1998 California Valley Girl Talk. We want to clean that up, or in this case, for those of you who are young, uh, the movie Clueless. So we want to try to avoid uh, those kinds of ums and uhs and likes, and we try to clean up to have the polish that comes with the speech. Articulation. We want to make sure we have our words come out clearly. Make those C's very sharp. Make those T's very sharp. And say the words with clarity. And again, you'd be very surprised the effects these kinds of uh, things we do with our voice uh, that we'll have with the audience when we have a very crisp way of saying the words. And the outro gets to this another thing about pronunciation. It does matter to say the words in their correct form. I'll be honest, it's also true that there's dialects because, you know, some people say roof, others say rough, some say pecan, like me, and the weird people who say pecan. Uh, that's a real thing, too. <laughs> but at the same time, there are words that need to be said in their correct forms, and we want to make sure we say them right because we want to show professionalism to the people we are talking to. So depending on the audience and the context and how well you know the community, uh, dialects can work. But again, there are uh, standard forms of saying certain words in the English language. And with that said, let's head on over to the next slide. And we have language and imagery. One of the things we also want to try to do is to keep things simple. We do try to want to avoid jargon. Uh, it has its place, it has its uh, reasons to be used, but when it comes to lectures and speeches, we want to make sure we are understood by everybody. So that's why using words that everybody knows rather than having a few people know them would be a great advantage for you as a speaker because we want to be understood by everybody. At the same time, the use of repetition. I'm not saying saying uh, something over and over and over and over again, but we want to place the message and repeat the message in certain spots of the speech to make sure that the message stays with the audience as we are saying them. And also at the same time, to use personal pronouns like I, us, we, you, and especially when it comes to we and us, because one thing the audience members do like is knowing that the speaker is along with the audience. And so we want to create this immediacy, the closeness with the audiences. And one of the best ways to do this is with the word choices and the use of pronouns. Another thing to consider as well is the use of similes, metaphors, and an analogy. When it comes to similes, this is when it comes to using like or as. Uh, metaphors, when it comes to referencing one thing in a comparison to another. An analogy it is an extended metaphor. Probably the best example here is I would ask my students, uh, if you were to describe me to your parents using a metaphor or a simile, how would you do that? And they would always, especially the younger students, they'd always use the, uh, the character from Moana known as Maui. And <laughs> because for some odd reason, they think I sound like the rock. And so, uh, this is a great way to bring concepts and ideas to people who may not know what it is or may be completely new to them. And so the use of similes, metaphors, analogies will help bridge that gap from something that they don't know and comparing it to something they do know. Uh, repetition. Uh, when it comes to the use of anaphor and epiphor. Now, a good example here would be today, and this is an uh, anaphor actually, today I will eat a hamburger. Today, I will work out that hamburger. Today, I will pass out after that workout. And so you see uh, the use of the repetition at the beginning of the sentence. Uh, and for the epiphore, it's the use of repetition at the end of the sentence, which does create a great effect with the audience members. Uh, and also the use of parallelism and antithesis. Parallelism, probably the best example here for this would be Abraham Lincoln's of the people, by the people, and for the people. And you can see how, how much of a dramatic effect that can bring to the audience. And my personal favorite antithesis, 
And probably the best example, my favorite, and for those who are uh, literature nerds, uh, it is the best of times, it was the worst of times. And of course, that comes from A Tale of Two Cities by Dickens. The thing we want to avoid is the use of cliches. We all hate them for a reason. I certainly do, especially when people say that's the way the cookie crumbles because, you know, it's just one of those things like, oh, don't use that. Avoid cliches as best as you can. And lastly, to help build this up for you, record yourself. Yes, I know it's weird to hear yourself, but it's necessary. I hear myself all the time. I still don't like it. (laughs) <laughs> but it's necessary to help you improve your vocal variety and to rehearse your vocal variety as well. The big thing we want to do is to show people that you are human, that you have this naturalness to present the message that you want to present and to do it in a polished and professional manner. And with that said, we will now turn it over to Dr. or excuse me, Professor Tracy Lang. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Duval. I have the privilege of joining Dr. Duval and Dr. Stagg and keep talking about this favorite subject of communication. I would like to really talk to you about this power that you have within you. And some of you may not even realize how powerful it is. So I want to take the next minutes and kind of pull this power apart and let's look at how you can use your nonverbal communication effectively. Just adding on to what you've already heard today, I'm going to go into the weeds. I'm going to define it and then we're going to break it apart and then I'm going to talk about putting it back together. Okay, let's get started. Basically, and then um, go ahead and switch to the next slide, Dr. Stack. Yeah, basically, Nonverbal communication is all of the ways we communicate besides words. That takes in quite a bit. Uh, research has stated a pretty wide range, 65% to 93% of our communication and is emotional meaning. Comes down to our nonverbals. And that's a lot. So let's look at what the power is. Go ahead, next slide. So basically, the purpose is nonverbal communication, they state that it is is impossible not to communicate. And it's because of your nonverbals. Silence communicates, not speaking up. So it's inevitable. It's a primary conveyor of our emotions. It's multi-channeled, which here in a minute, I'm going to break it apart and let you see those different channels. And the thing is, it's ambiguous. That means that it can mean different things in different people and different cultures. So it can actually be confusing. So what's the characteristics? Well, it can substitute for your verbal. Definitely, you can wave at someone down the way and you're substituting and not stating it but it can also you can also say hey how are you doing and you're complimenting your verbal it could also regulate by doing the head nods so that someone will continue talking to you it can also conflict with the verbal so if you're telling someone that you're listening to them but yet you're looking at something else what are they going to believe they're going to believe that you're not listening and it can also moderate that verbal and again that is many ways we use our body language to keep people talking to us using our distance and different things and it can repeat okay so now let's break them down I, there's a lot of what we call codes nonverbal codes and i've kind of lumped them together in these six categories and i'm going to go pretty quick through them so definitely if you have questions put that in your chat for later and i'll address those but we're going to look at the power of your physical appearance your kinesics or body language. We're going to look at proxemics, being close in your environment. We'll look at your face and your eye, touch and haptics, and we'll end with the time. All right, so let's get started. The very first thing, physical appearance, and that all-important attraction. Attraction is super important. And honestly, we like to think that we talk to all people and that we have conversations with everyone, but there is this physical uh, 
uh, attraction. And we actually will do this thing in our brain they call the halo effect, meaning that if we're more, if we see someone that is attractive, we actually think, we think that they're good people. We think that they're nicer. We think that they're, that we give them good characteristics. And then sometimes we even, if someone's really tall and we see them, we think that they're leaders. So this halo effect is really um, powerful in our physical attraction to people. Also our clothes is, you, you know that this differs among um, our cultures that we're in, but clothing definitely sends signals to your audience. And then the artifacts can be anything you wear in addition to your clothing. We're going to look at the power of artifacts within our environment, but definitely your uh, earrings, your tattoos, your glasses. We as humans, we put meanings to those. We think that people are smarter that wear glasses. I, I don't know that that's true, <laughs> but definitely we take nonverbals and we put meanings to them. All right, so th these together have definitely power let's look at your physical body your gestures you know when you're talking you may use gestures we use them for many different things um, sometimes like we said we illustrate something i am just geographically challenged so when i give somebody directions i always get panicked but i use my hands well you go to the right oh no you go to the left you turn there you turn back there's the elevator and what we're doing we're using them as an illustrator our body language we're also regulating like i mentioned before the conversations and then we have these things called adapters when we're real nervous maybe you have that adapter think of what you do when you're nervous and you don't even sometimes know you're doing it i know i shake my leg i move my fingers my high energy comes out in different forms those adapters on an interview are not a good thing that's when you really need to know your adapters and think, think about them. Also during a presentation, you're not so good either. If you know that you shake your hands a lot and during show that you're visibly nervous and write on your notes, on your note cards or what you're referring to in your speech, slow down, breathe, just like you heard Dr. Duval talk about and others. Okay, so you have your gestures and then you have your posture. Um, go to the next slide and tell me this next picture that flips up. What do those people tell you? Oops, but what do they tell you? What message are they coming through on that picture? If you put that they're tired, that they're bored, that they're lazy, yeah, our posture has a lot to send out a lot of signals. And definitely, Dr. Stagg mentioned this in the beginning when it comes to your presentation. I want to reiterate that walking with good posture when you're going up to give your presentation i always say take command of the podium and and show even if you don't feel it show with your posture that you're confident and in the workplace i always tell the story about the person that uh, i worked in hr and they would come and want to promote them and give them promotions and i would always say i would always say you know you think he works hard because he walks so fast and, the, and they would say well yeah you're right he does walk fast everywhere i said so we've made that connection between someone that walks fast through the manufacturer floor as a hard worker now whether they are or not i don't know but right now five years later he's running the whole engineering group so i know that your posture and the way that you use your body sends signals in the workforce Okay, so let's keep going. We've gone through three rather quickly. Now let's talk about your actual proxemics, meaning how close you get to people, how you use space. And, you know, during the pandemic, we've talked a lot about this, having that six feet to protect ourselves from germs. But in the communication world, we break it down a little bit differently. Your intimate space, that 18 inches, is your personal space. That's who you allow people in that you're very, very close to. I know if we were sitting together in a classroom, I would come up and just get right near you and you would be very uncomfortable because that is what getting in somebody's personal space makes them uncomfortable. And that personal space goes up to four feet. I know we say six feet for our germs, but in communication, we kind of look at it up to four feet. And then your social space, when you run up to your friends and say hello, 
below or you see somebody you know, four to 12 feet and then over 12 feet, we consider our public space. So in the workforce, be ever cognitive of that in your office of invading someone's personal space because again, cultures dictate this. Some cultures are very, very comfortable being in your personal space, but others are not. So again, be just aware of the fact that you can make people uncomfortable if you get too close. All right, and then adding to that, we have the environment. Go ahead and click the slide. The environment that you find yourself in definitely communicates as well. Environment in the workplace states so much. It actually it's like a territory, your personal territory and how you use your space. And you know, I wanna to say to you, if you are thinking about changing work or going into a work, always look at the territory, always look at their environment, look and see if you, you knowing yourself, would you be able to thrive in that environment? What, when you take a tour and make sure you do during that interviewing process, look around. If they say they're a family friendly company, then look and see, do the staff members have pictures of their families up? Do they have pictures around of them having fun? I've worked at a place that said they were a fun atmosphere. And so that's what you want to look for. Is there, is there things in their environment that that tell that what they're saying to you is true. And then also finding if you would feel comfortable in that environment. Do you need your own personal space? Do you need privacy? Do you always like to eat fish every day for lunch and would that smell drive your coworkers crazy? Do they have a lunchroom? That might sound small, but it's amazing how just that, just smell alone in an environment will make people where they're on edge and have more conflicts. So you wanna look at those things as well when you're trying to decide your office setup. Okay, so let's keep going. We talked about this power of our environment. Now let's look at our face. We've already mentioned, Dr. Stagg mentioned the smile and the power of a smile. Definitely uh, a smile is universal. We find that there is only a few emotions that are universally supported by research and definitely Happiness and a smile is one of those. You have that power to genuinely show your emotions, but you can also, through your face, you can also try to mask your feelings. Some people are better at it than others. I know I'm not. I kind of, you can look at me and kind of know what I'm feeling. And some people are good at making a neutral face. Some people are good at de-intensifying their emotions. They feel really strongly, but they know that that they tend to be very, have exaggerated uh, movements and exaggerated emotions. So they'll try their best to de-intensify their face. Again, this is a learned thing. Some of us as humans, this makes us human is what I tell uh, my students that definitely you want to, uh, be active with your with your audience. Make sure they know, see your passion coming for the through for the um, for your subject. And then also you talk about the eye behavior. Oh wow, one of the strongest nonverbals is your eye behavior. We decide who we're going to trust just whether they give us their eyes, whether they look at us in their eyes. And definitely, this is some of us on this scale. And this is where I want you to judge yourself. Are you one that has no problem giving people eye contact and actually smiling and, and looking at them? Are you on the other end of the scale where you would prefer not to give eye contact? You would prefer to keep your eyes down. It's like your personal space. You don't want to invade it. And again, if you're on this other side that you tend to, uh, you've gotten in a habit of not looking up as much, Definitely, I want to encourage you to use this power of eye behavior. Use this power. Look up. Give people, give people the benefit of looking at them. You don't have to stare them down and be the obsessor, as we call it. But definitely, when you're giving that speech, you want to make sure everyone in your audience is seeing you. I always say, don't be the head bobber either, going click, 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 click. But just definitely, slowly looking around the audience and knowing, just like Dr. Stack said, being confident of using your eyes. Ooh, then that brings us to touch and haptics. Touch is one of the most misunderstood 
of the nonverbals in the workforce. So again, we have functional touch where we have this professional in North America, you know, we shook hands until the pandemic hit and then we were like, oh my God, what do we do? What do we do? And definitely different people did elbow bumps and feet bumps and, and hand bumps. We've learned different ways of touching people. But one thing through research we know def definitively is that without touch, humans don't do well. We don't have to have a pandemic to tell us that. We know that. And so definitely figuring out um, your level of comfort with touch is coming from your culture, but also knowing the culture of your workplace. Is everybody hugging everybody? Is everybody just barely touching anyone? Knowing that culture will help you to use your communication effectively. And the same in the same in when you are presenting, just feel the audience wants to feel like you're touching them. So use your words too. Okay, well, James already talked about that. So let's keep going. The next nonverbal, change slides there. The next one is time and our interpretation of time. You know, some of us are so punctual. Our school systems, I think, does this to us. We have bells that tells us when to change in our early years of school. And then when we get to college, we have set times that our classes start and when they end. You know, that whole monochronic and looking at time as if it's money, that is seeing it as a monetized unit. But a lot of times, cultures, especially our cultures and our neighbor cultures, look at time more fluidly. They look at it so that it just blends, okay? It is your job as a communicator to figure out the culture you're in, the culture of your audience, the culture of your workplace. And if everybody is on time and they prize people for being on time, then you make a mental, a mental um, kind of hold yourself discipline to be early. And when I say early, that means different things to different people. So even five minutes early, I've heard countless students tell me how they were promoted because they just got to meetings five minutes early. I've also heard countless people tell me that they received a promotion in their, and their uh, supervisor had said, well, you just, you just know when to talk to me. You just, your timing's perfect. Well, again, Look at your coworkers. If they're not morning people and they're grouchy in the morning, then keep those strong conversations with them to a different point. Just makes sense, right? Knowing timing and using it for your advantage. Now, you can put all these together. It's like a forest. I have a picture of a forest there. One tree by itself, oh, it's pretty. But put a whole bunch of trees together and you have a forest and it's strong. It can block the light. It can be, uh, you can get lost in it. Well, that's the same with your nonverbals. When you pull them together, they become strong. And that's what we call immediacy behavior. So again, and when you're wanting to build a relationship with someone, being able to use your space to lean towards them, use your body, give them some head nods. I always say eye contact, head nods, leaning in. Definitely, these send a signal that you are interested in what they say. If you're an audience member, just giving head nods, leaning in, smiling, those are going to tell the speaker, keep going, you're doing this. As a speaker, we've already spoke about earlier about how you can use your nonverbals of space and time and your body movements to keep your audience's attention. Again, you want to use this power, use it, not just in your interviewing process. I know that's different seminars, but definitely this is what we teach. Use those immediacy to build connections because we're humans and we need connections. And so use that. All right. So once you've used it and put it all together, then this gets in the technical and I won't spend too much time on it, but I just want to kind of scratch the surface that there's micro expressions, very micro. So when you do a smile and if it's a fake smile, it's hard to move your eyes too. And so micro expressions are tiny, tiny little bitty movements of your of your nonverbals. Usually we say the face, but it also does with your shoulders and with your body. That is, these micro expressions kind of uncover, uncover, because a lot of times 
you can use your nonverbals to cover the truth. You can try. You can try. And some people are better at it than others. Look at a poker tournament. The, the poker players have worked at covering their nonverbals so that no one knows what's in their hand and their cards that they play. Also, people we fascinated we have on Netflix and these platforms about people that have deceived us. You know, look at the one that's popular now about Anna. Definitely, they have used their nonverbals to deceive people into thinking that they're somebody that they're not. So that's what I get asked a lot. How do I know when somebody's lying to me? And I said, well, it's it's a difficult science but look at the look at the micro expressions and then finally the power of this forest of nonverbals is making impressions i always say know yourself because your nonverbals are so powerful that if you use them for a job interview and then you land that job and you really didn't want to work there it could backfire. So I say know what you're going for. Know your objective and use your nonverbals, this power you have to communicate effectively and appropriately and ethically. Okay, so we've gone over, we dissected nonverbals, we looked at all the different types of it. I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Stagg or... Okay, thank you all for joining us. Just to recap, we talked about effective delivery. We took a look at vocal variety and Professor Lee just finished up with the power of nonverbal communication. Should you have any questions after Mr. Regenbaum gives his presentation, please put those questions in the chat and remember that our speech and communications program is here at HCC. So if you're interested in taking a class to learn more, please reach out to us. Um, and Dr. Stag, we definitely have questions. Uh, I've already counted six questions. Uh, we have a, a live stream audience of about 22 viewers and 17 on this call, uh, including us. So there's uh, some engagement there. So uh, as you've shared, uh, we will ask all questions at the end. Uh, at this point, I'm going to pass the presenter ball to our entrepreneur and resident at Houston Community College. Uh, as well as the HCC Foundation Board Chairman, uh, Mr. David Regenbaum. And Mr. Regenbaum is going to talk about uh, the pitch presentations or business pitch presentations. Um, uh, over to you, sir. Good morning, Ravi, and good morning, everyone present today. <clears throat> Before I start, I just want to compliment the previous uh, presenters. Uh, I was fascinated by what they say and what they said in their presentations because it, there's no difference to what they have presented this morning and what I'm going to present as a, a business pitch presentation. It is all about presenting yourself and presenting your ideas and everything that you've heard this morning is relevant and very important that you look at. I will be repeating a lot of that as we go through this presentation. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to comment on the Centers for Entrepreneurship. We have been uh, very successful over the last four or five years and have won several co competitions, including the Entrepreneurial College of the Year from the National Association of Community College Entrepreneurship, the, Di the Diversity in Business Awards, and the Bellwether Award, uh, which we won only last month uh, on the, you know, the 2022 award winner of the Bellwether College Consortium. Um, let's talk about a pitch. What is a pitch? Anytime you ask someone for something, you are making a pitch. Whether it is asking a parent to borrow a car, whether it is asking a favor of someone, whether it's trying to sell something or to get a new job, you are making a pitch. So what we're gonna be talking about is everything about pitching. The first aspect of that is, are you credible? It takes someone less than seven seconds to determine your credibility. Uh, Dr. Duval spoke about body language, the way you walk into the room, the way you make eye contact, the way you look at someone, your appearance, your clothing. All of these are uh, analyzed within seven seconds by the audience. 
and determine, they determine then whether you're credible. You have got to be credible to be believed. You have got to be credible for someone to buy something from you and to want to do business with you. So being credible is fundamental to being uh, to, to your pitch. Uh, without being credible, you are not going to succeed. And uh, working on your credibility is something that all of the three previous speakers spoke about in the way they presented their uh, presentations. So from a business point of view, you are selling something, you're selling a product, you are selling a service. And the way that you sell something is to, determine, is to determine what problem are you solving? What is the buyer of your product or service uh, lacking? What do they want? Uh, how would they benefit from what you are providing? What is your solution? What solution are you providing to their problem? And, find, and the other aspect, of course, is who is your target audience? You could be pitching to a bank to borrow money for your business. You can be pitching to a new employee to join your company. You can be pitching to a, a customer to buy your product. Each target audience is a separate uh, business pitch, and you need to look at it from a different perspective. But it's the same basic information that you are pitching. It is the same aspect of your business that you are pitching to all your target audiences. It is simply a different nuance of whether the pitch is to ask for money from a lender or from uh, a contract with a buyer. Each one is going to be uh, different. What is your market opportunity compared to the competition? What are the competition in uh, providing to your marketplace and what di differentiates you? Why are you different to your competition? And then finally, what are you asking for? What is your closing? Um, the comment was made earlier about the use of pauses. Once you've made your pitch, keep quiet. Or once you've made your ask, keep quiet. The purpose of a pitch is to start a conversation and get the conversation going. Sorry, I went backwards. At the beginning, Ravi mentioned the nine C's of an effective pitch. First of all, being concise. Gettys the Gettysburg Address uh, was only two minutes, and it is amazing how many people have been quoted as saying, if I had more time, I would have made my pitch shorter. Yeah, my presentation would have been shorter if I had more time to prepare. Being concise is a very valuable aspect. People don't want repetition. People don't want to hear the same thing over and over again. They want a concise statement from, from you. It must be clear. So don't use MBA speech. Don't use uh, $10 words when $1 word will apply. When you present your pitch to your grandparents, to your children, will they understand it? Your pitch must be clear so that it really can be understood by everyone. Again, this was said earlier today, that you need to do your pitch in such a way that everyone in your audience understands what you're saying. Being clear is the key to that. Don't use abbreviations. Don't use acronyms. Be absolutely clear on what your intention what you're saying. Be compelling. Make it a good story. Make it as if it's going to be really effective to get your uh, answer to your story. As I've said, an effective pitch is an invitation to have a discussion. It is not the, the discussion itself. If you are asking for something, ask it clearly. Ask it in a compelling manner. Avoid using a passive uh, tones, passive voices. Use compelling language to get your pitch across. Be credible. Again, I mentioned that earlier. Being credible is recognized within 15, within seven seconds of your pitch. So having your one minute pitch and being there for the first seven seconds, you have to make an impression. 
it's body language, it's all of this non-verbal communication, uh, it's all of the language that's important, it's the clear compelling language that's important. Being conceptual, when you're making a pitch, make your pitch conceptual so that the people that you're pitching to have an impression, an idea of what you're saying, but they want more information. It must be concrete enough so that the uh, audience wants more information and evolves into a conversation. It's essential that you have that conversation to be effective. If you are simply pitching and the uh, per person to whom you're pitching is simply listening without giving you feedback, without uh, giving you information or asking you questions and getting into a conversation, you're not going to be effective. You need to have that conversation going to make it important. You must customize your pitch depending on your audience, uh, whether it's to a banker, whether it's to a lender, whether it is to a, a customer, or whether it is to a job seeker. If you are looking to achieve the objective of your pitch, you must customize it to the, to the audience to whom you're pitching. It must be consistent. Whether you customer, whether you are pitching to an, or the various audiences, no matter which audience you're pitching to, be consistent in that the fundamental idea of your pitch, the fundamental idea, your fundamental business idea, comes across as being very effective. And then, as I've said time again, being con conversational. You don't want to scream at the audience. You don't want to shout at the audience. You don't want to be angry. You want to have your uh, emotion under control. And the more control you have in your emotion, the better your pitch becomes. So let's talk about a business stretch. First of all, know your product or service. If you achieve that conversational aspect, if you achieve the conversation with the audience, you need, they're going to ask you uh, questions about your product or service. You need to know every facet of your product or service. You need to know every nuance of what it can do and what the need is of the individual. You want to know what the benefits of your product or service are, and you want to know what the results they will bring to your audience. Each of those elements are important in your business pitch presentation. Knowing your audience, uh, you can Google them before you approach them. You need to know some banks won't lend to restaurants. Other banks won't lend to other types of businesses. Some banks won't lend to uh, startups. Other banks require three years of uh, financials before. Each of these aspects are important when, you, when you're doing your pitch. So knowing the audience and in, uh, finding out as much as you can about them, knowing their, everything about them that you can possibly gather, Google them, know how they behave, try and find out from uh, their reputation in the industry. The more you know about your audience, the more you can customize your pitch presentation to the audience. Be passionate about its value to customers. If you are not passionate about your product or service, your audience won't accept it. Your audience won't want to buy that product or service from you. Your audience won't want to give you what you're asking for. So being passionate is really the fundamental of what your pitch is going to be about. You have to really love what you're doing. And if you don't, then you need to try and fake it. It's not going to be as effective, but being passionate is absolutely important. Knowing your competitors, knowing what they present and how they present it. If, the, if your audience asks questions about your competitors, oh, I can buy this at Amazon, why should I buy it from you? You need to give valid reasons why your products and the way you sell it is preferable to anyone else's product or service. So know your competitors. I'm not saying that you must uh, defame your competitors, 
I'm not saying that you must decry your, your competitors. You must be a valid criticism and give valid concept as to why your product is better than your competitors. And then finally, build a story. Your pitch presentation must be a story that people are attracted to. All of those facets are necessary in your business pitch competition. As I've said before, be efficient, effective, and compelling. Avoid uh, expressions like, we would like to. Don't say we would like to. We are going to. We are going to be the best product in the, in the uh, arena. We are going to provide the best service available. Not, we are going to try and provide you with the best service. That's not compelling. That's not effective. And again, be as simple and memorable and convincing as you can possibly be. Take the time to practice. Take the time to know what you're doing. There is a uh, TED talk by Simon Sinek on pitch presentations. And he advises you to think through what we do. Most people can understand what we do. Think through how we do it. Most pe a few people will understand how we do it. But the why, the why is the passion, the why is the reason. And people like to buy from people that are passionate about what they're doing and why they're doing it. Uh, I would urge you to take the time to listen to the TED talk on, uh, by Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K. Uh, he's got a few pitch presentations on the TED talks, which are worth listening to. Next, looking at the one minute pitch presentation, also known as the elevator pitch. First of all, have a headline. If you think about the newspapers, Journalists write the articles. They write these lengthy articles for the newspaper. It goes to an editor. An editor reads the article. And if the editor decides to print the article, the editor will determine what the headline should be. I get uh, Inc. Uh, magazine. I get Forbes magazine uh, daily sent to me uh, through the internet. And all I read is the headlines. Once I determine that the headline is of interest to me, only then will I read the article. Only then will I click on the headline to read the article. So think through and determine what your headline is. What is the most important element of your pitch? And give that as the headline. Ask a question. Ask a question regarding the problem you're solving. But find a headline that is intriguing that, that makes it someone want to do business with you. Who are you? Again, be incredible. What is your background? Do you have a relevant background that they can have confidence in your ability? And then what are you trying to accomplish? What are your solutions? What solution are you providing for the particular problem that you're trying to, that you're trying to solve? And then make the ask and close out with a pause. Don't continue to talk beyond that. That's the invitation from the audience to start asking questions. And that is the, in the next section of your one minute pitch presentation. Megan Eddings won the lift off Houston pitch presentation and then came to Houston Community College and did the uh, Houston uh, Community College business plan competition and won that. And I asked her, what is the seven keys to a great pitch? And she spoke about confident body language and voice. You've heard this from the previous speakers, posture, smile, uh, eye contact, movement. And then uh, the, from business point of view, show that there is a market and why you are the best solution. Build credibility of the founder. Again, credibility comes into play. What is your educational background? What is your background to have the knowledge and ability to provide the solution? Be realistic with projections. Don't, uh, don't be over ambitious because many of your audience will know as much as you do about the product or service and will value your honesty. Videotape 
your pitch many times. Uh, a previous speaker spoke about the uh, videotaping and uh, recording your presentations, listening to your voice when you do the videotape or the recording as many times as you can listen to it and keep improving it. The more you listen, the more you can improve. Simple and concise slides. Don't have the judges focusing on the slides and not on you. If you're going to do a slide presentation, have simple, concise slides. And then first impressions. Again, going back to your credibility. The first impression will be you, not your pitch. So dress professionally, look professional. All of these you've heard before. Uh, this morning, all of the speakers spoke uh, glowingly about all of these factors. These are no different. One way of de uh, developing your pitch presentation is brainstorming. Take all of your ideas, work with friends and family, with uh, co-workers, and write a separate element of every single facet of your pitch on post-it notes. And then paste the post-it notes on a wall. And when you've done that, select five of the most important of the post-it notes. Select five that are the most critical post-it notes and use those to develop your pitch. You need to know everything else. You need to know all of the uh, ideas, but develop the five most important to be most effective in your pitch. Uh, as a matter of interest, my granddaughter, 10-year-old granddaughter, used her mother for her brainstorming uh, exercise and pasted the post-it notes all over, all over my daughter. Again, using that brainstorming exercise is one way of doing it. Another way is mind mapping. Mind mapping you look at your opportunities and what opportunities do you see? What is your niche? What distinguishes you from your uh, competition? What are the marketplace challenges that you see? What are the most critical issues, the pressing challenges, and what actions would you take now? The mind map will look something like this, looking at your strategies, your financials, your executive summary, all of the various facets, facets of your ideas, and then break them out into branches. Again, I'm not saying that you need to use all of these. You need to know them all and then select the most important ones to present as your business pitch, to present as your business plan and your business idea. And then practice. No one succeeds without practice. Whether you are a sportsman, whether you are a musician, no matter what you are, practice. Practice in front of a mirror. Practice uh, in front of your family and friends until they are bored, stupid with what you're saying and uh, say it's enough already. But you need to practice, practice. The more practice you have, the more confidence you'll have and the better your pitch presentation will go. Your one minute pitch exercise then is to brainstorm each and every facet of your idea. Select the five most important facets of your pitch to use for a one minute pitch. Don't bury the lead. Find your headline and use your headline effectively. Team up with friends and family to present your one minute pitch and then ask them to critique your pitch and to provide you with feedback to your presentation. Do this constantly and the more practice you have, the better it is. The use of PowerPoint. Um, PowerPoint can be in a very effective use or it can be a boring distraction. So these are 10 of the ideas that are the secrets for using PowerPoint effectively. Start by creating an outline. The outline again is going back to the mind mapping or the brainstorm. Use contrasting colors that clearly define your uh, ideas, whether it's a dark background with light lettering or a light background with dark lettering. Uh, we have adopted this dark purple and white and gold are the, are the three colors that we use at the Centers for Entrepreneurship. Those contrasting colors make it easy to read. Use big enough font. 
I have a bad habit of using my pointer and moving it around during my presentations. And I keep having to remind myself not to do so. So don't have moving text. Moving text creates the audience to uh, refocus their attention on the text instead of keeping their focus on you. So keep the text still. Change your uh, PowerPoint effectively. Turn the pointer off. Use visuals wherever possible instead of text. Graphs, charts are much more effective than text. Have slides at the end of the presentation so that you don't go beyond the presentation. And learn how to use PowerPoint so that you can jump from slide to slide at will, that you can blank the screen if there's a question asked, that you don't want to have the screen as a distraction and be able to draw on the screen. All of these are available in PowerPoint. If you look at the bottom corner, left-hand corner of your PowerPoint presentation, a lot of these uh, techniques are available to you at the bottom of your presentation. So that is my presentation. I wish you well in your opportunity to present your pitch, and I hope that you can learn from all of us today. I have learned from the other speakers, and you can always improve your pitch. Remember, practice, practice, practice. Thank you, Ravi. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Regenbaum. That was great. So, uh, at this point, we'll still continue. Um, we'll stop the screen share here. And we'll still continue the recording and the live streaming uh, for some of the questions that have come from the uh, online platforms. And uh, we will have a, a Q and A for uh, offline, off record, uh, you know, off the record as well. If, so if you want to do, just hang tight a little bit more for more personalized questions. But um, from the, the, the metaverse I've collected, uh, and then I've also rephrased some of the questions. Uh, if, it, if it didn't make sense in a comment, I, I, I try to put it in a, in a question format. So uh, we'll start this, and then you know any anyone can uh, can take this. But I think uh, the first question that I have here, uh, you know, and I think this is when you spoke about the halo effect, and I think this was uh, Tracy, you, you uh, when you had sh uh, shared this. So maybe you could uh, take this one first. Um, but it said, how do you limit uh, halo? And then you know the opposite of halo is a horn effect bias, right? So I, I added that and. Um, how do you limit either one of those uh, biases when you're on Zoom and virtual? I mean, and it's so hard to know what people are wearing because uh, you you made all these uh, suggestions. So, any thoughts about when you're presenting virtually? How do you limit? Thank you for the question. I I think that this bias is knowing yourself, and if you're asking how you limit it yourself from making that error. If, if I interpret that correctly, then I say start with yourself. Know that when you find someone attractive, you find yourself smiling more at them. Just know that your natural tendency is to think they're smart, is to think that they are morally good, to think that they are good at their job. And just knowing yourself is the best place to start to improve your communication accuracy. Also, perception checking. You know, those perceptions we make uh, real quickly, just doing questions, asking questions to kind of verify that your first impression was correct. That's what I would say. I, you know, I would lo love to hear Dr. Staggs and uh, James' input on that uh, as well. So yeah, so if there are um, that great, great uh, thoughts there, if there is, uh, if any of the other panelists want to take that on, uh, feel free to. I just want to give you a heads up. I've probably got five more questions lined up. So um, let's be mindful of time here. We're, we're, we, we did say we'll wrap up this event in the next seven minutes. Uh, but any thoughts, Dr. Stagg, um, Dr. Duvall? No, I completely agree with what Tracy was saying. You have to just put your perceptions in check. So you have to just keep an open mind and try not to judge a book based upon its cover. <laughs> I, okay. Totally agree. <laughs> All right, that's that's fair enough. Uh, and 
Uh, to be fair, let, let's try to do one uh, uh, main answer for the next few questions. Uh, to be fair on time. Uh, all right. The next question uh, was was uh, by the way, uh, James, uh, you have this voice that really you know I could I could see you reading a book and, and enjoying uh, your tone, your control was was fantastic. And the next question comes on voice control. So how do I slow down and and pronounce better? And and this individual said they're not an English speaker or native English speaker in in uh, in the comment there. So so any tips uh, on voice control? And David, certainly you can add uh, to this as well. Uh, I guess um, I've actually had students come up to me and say what they would do that would help them, uh, especially in terms of pronunciation is. Uh, they would listen to some, somebody that they like, uh, be it an actress, actor, whoever it may be, and try to mimic that uh, and, and, and to sound that per like that person. Uh, that's just one way to go with it. There are actually other ways to do it. Sometimes you just have to record yourself, listen, and then you sort of have to force yourself to slow down. And then you start to see the differences in yourself, but there are other ways to do it. We have a voice and diction class uh, specifically for this uh, sort of aspect. It's speech, which, what speech course is this, uh, understand? And we could certainly uh, share the link. Yeah, 1322 voice 40. and diction. Uh, 42 helps with this sort of aspect. I'm sorry, go ahead, Ravi. No, no, thank you. That helps. Um, and then David, um, you certainly have this accent that gets attention. So I would love to get your thoughts on voice control and then being able to pronounce and just tips on on, on how to make that better. Or should they make it better? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Ravi, I'm smiling because uh, I have purposely retained my accent to a large extent. Uh, because it differentiates me from my competitors. Uh, they remember they remember the guy with this English accent, although it's South African, not English. Uh, but uh, I think it's important that you retain some uh, authenticity uh, and not try and change too much because it comes across as uh, sort of not credible, not vi not viable. And I think you need to uh, practice makes a lot of benefits, but don't change your personality through that. Uh, that that affects your credibility, your personality, and everything else. That's great. I love that advice. Be you and, and practice. Take that class. <laughs> and yeah. that's great. So uh, let's go on to the next question here. It says, uh, "How can?" Um, Sorry, let me make sure I read this one. Uh, so how can I learn to think before talking? I often say random things and feel disorganized. So <laughs> uh, this is a human uh, problem for, for all of us. Uh, any thoughts, tips about that? Um, we'll take one answer here. Yeah. Anyone? Uh, I guess I'll take it really quick. It gets, usually that happens from what I see from students uh, is the anxiety is there. And when the anxiety rises, you start to get flustered and you start to feel disorganized. Uh, take a breather <laughs> would be one thing. Breathe, definitely. And then start to ease back in as you're starting to talk and you'll start to organize your thoughts a bit more. It does take practice and experience. This is true. Uh, but manage your anxiety would be the best start for it. You know, that's one thing to that too. You also want to make sure that you pause and that's something that Professor Duval talked about, but there is a social stigma when pausing. So it's like when people ask us a question, they expect us to just be able to answer just like that. But it's not natural. You want to be able to gather your thoughts so that you can communicate your response. So use those pauses. So when you're trying to organize your ideas in your head, feel comfortable with using those pauses. Great answers there. Great suggestions. And you know, this the next question actually is quite uh, related. So I'm going to skip um, skip that one. We'll we'll go to another one uh, that says at work. Some people hug. Some people don't. Um, 
it creates a signal that some people are part of a team and others are not. Um, how can we tell everyone to come up with one universal team culture to hug or not? <laughs> and I, I love how they've added the solution, but but I'm, I'm curious, what, what, what do our faculty think about that? Uh, that culture of hugging and not hugging? Well, I, I really do think that teams develop over time. And if this is a perception they see happening, then maybe you need to figure out another nonverbal that unifies the team. Maybe it's a different signal that y'all give each other, like a high five or a, because um, as humans, we have a lot of those different types of signals. And then to unify, that's what I would say. It's kind of hard to break patterns but you can start a new pattern and that's what i would encourage that's that's great yeah you your, your team definitely needs a, a mediator to come in and, and, and come to a, a universal consensus all right that's great last question i care to learn but i am often tired in class what can i do to show that i want to learn wow actually that that one i can i I've got students that maybe are laid back or their heads on the table sometimes that they cared enough to show up, but but they're tired. So, so uh, any suggestions? I mean, wow, this is this one hits I would, home. I would say get some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> it's not not it's not just good for you to you know be attentive in class, but just good for you in general. Get some sleep. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll um, add to that is just, you know, maybe organize. Um, I know I know students work as well, but really try to manage your time better. Um, if you don't have to watch that TikTok video and then find yourself watching videos for four hours and not sleeping at night, you really got to put the phone away. You really got to organize it. Uh, it looks like David, you have to have may, may I just make a comment on this? Uh, I think some of it has to do with your attitude and interest in the topic uh, you can learn every you can learn from every single uh, presentation there is always some element there is some uh, little iota of information that you can learn from and paying attention and wanting to learn have an attitude of being interested in learning will make the difference great suggestion great point so you know, it is time, so I want to share this last contact slide for all of us. And then, um, you know, for those of us who are still um, on the the WebEx call, stick around. Uh, but, uh, you know, I definitely want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Stagg. Do um, reach out to us. Uh, the, the format at the college is firstname.lastname at hccs.edu for email uh, contact. Uh, if you have any other questions and you wanted to uh, ask them directly to the panelists, please uh, feel free to reach out and contact us directly. But at this time, we'll wrap up our presentation and we'll stop the live streaming and the recording. Um, so we'll stop there and thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>